Hi again everyone, it's Rob Ryder, and today will be Rob Ryder Reads Court Orders on February 24th, 2022. Let's see what the courts have to say when they write back. Right, I, I'm a believer that there's things written between the lines that uh, can lead to some kind of solution if we were just to read the stuff between the lines. Well, to do that, you have to have them send you some lines to read. got to have some bars. And they did. They sent uh, these two different cases. Things have come in, and we're going to take a look at them. Uh, before that, though, hey, I'm Staff Sergeant Robert Allen Rutluski, United States Army veteran, also known as Rob Ryder. My email address is courtofrecord at AOL.com. And for all veterans out there, you, you didn't know this, you've never been released from the military. All right, so keep your rank. And, uh, you know, claim your position. Because otherwise, they're going to want to make you a mister in a system where a mister is a class well below an esquire. And an esquires are what we thought were lawyers. Well, an esquire is actually, by definition, an agent of the crown. And there's where the problems start. But it's just not attorneys. It's, you know, all professionals who abuse their profession to take advantage of their neighbor because that would be against the golden rule and, right, we're acting like heathens. So that's got to come to an end. And truthfully, that's some of what Putin's doing right now. But that'll have to be for a different video. Okay, so what I want to do is, uh, there's two different cases we're going to look at. One is uh, where somebody had called me back in December about, uh, actually they talked about a traffic ticket. And then mentioned that they had this case in an appeals court. And so we submitted something. And the other one is about uh, uh, a foreclosure that uh, I've already done a number of videos on that I'll we'll take a quick look so you can go, or at least I'll show you where to find the links if you want to watch them. But uh, uh, we had put in uh, basically a thing called a constitutional question. Actually, Warren did it on, on his own. He watched the video I did put in a, a, a notice of constitutional question, which we soon found out afterwards it really hadn't done right. It wasn't that the idea wasn't right, just procedurally it hadn't been done right. But it was done right enough to get the judge to pay attention and dismiss the case. But since then, the original plaintiff's attorney is well gone by now, and they've gone to these big kahunas uh, right from downtown Manhattan. You know, I mean, right on uh, ground zero, basically. And they had filed to uh, re-argue and uh, something else, the case. And that's what the order's about. So it's interesting stuff. Uh, you know, if you're looking for a solution. Now, none of these are a solution. I don't have a solution. I can't fix your problem. There's no reason to write me and say, hey, can you help me with my court case? Because I don't have an answer. Right? I mean, I'm looking for answers. So I do these things. And I talk about them. But, you know. In between, I'm finding all the shit they do wrong and putting it and concentrating it into a form that I can talk into a video form and then share with the Army, National Security Agency, or whoever else wants to pay attention. Because otherwise, no one's going to put a voice to it. And, uh, and so I'm just, uh, you know, upholding my Constitution daily. Thank you very much. On my Constitution, my, my oath of office to support and defend the Constitution. Okay, enough yammering. Let's get on to why we're here. So give me just a second. Okay, so let's start uh, with the case that's in a court of appeals, right? And this is in the state of Mississippi, number 2021-CP00495-COA. All right, where we have uh, appellate versus, versus the appellees and you know, I don't really even know what the case is about. Um, how, however, as I look at it now, I think the original problem was that there's some kind of, uh, you know, uh, child support issue going on in the lower court that Jeffrey had brought uh, to the appeals court. And so he was doing his appeal. That was going on all by itself anyways. And uh, he had called me because he got a traffic ticket that weekend and then had mentioned this case. And so we wrote something to put in. And I developed it... Uh, uh, led to this order. But um, the order was really based on, uh, because the matter comes before the undersigned on the motion of Robert Glenn Wadle, 
individually and in his official capacity as chairman of Mississippi Bar Committee on professional responsibility. All right, so the Mississippi Bar Committee of Professional Responsibility brought a motion to the court to have stricken, to strike him as improper extra record notices and materials filed by pro se appellant Jeffrey Courtney J or Court J Jackson on December 27, 2021. Well, they're talking about the stuff that was put in. So before we read the order, let's go look at the emotion that they filed in the first place, right? So this is what the, um, the bar basically filed based on what had been filed by Jeff into his court case. So uh, now comes appellees. Yeah, we got their names. We know who they are. Uh, through counsel, right? Here and after, collectively, the Mississippi bar officials, right? So while they're using these different, uh, their different titles, right? They're Mississippi bar officials. By and through counsel, and pursuant to these rules, 27 and 30, file uh, this their motion to strike improper extra record notices and materials filed by pro se appellant Jeffrey Court J. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Don't let him call you Mr. But you notice how they put that in uh, parentheses and then inside of that quotes. We probably, um, one of the things we may have told him is don't call me Mr. I have to go. Well, we'll see in a second. Anyways, um, on December 27th. And in support thereof, would show unto the court the following. The court should strike the entirety of the 17-page document filed by Mr. Jackson. Right now, I call him Mr. Because uh, no portion of documents contained in the record of the appeal, the documents purport to relate to an alleged constitutional question that was not raised in the court below, and the assertions made in the document are facially absurd. So that's what they said. As the Mississippi Supreme Court docket will reflect, right, as the Mississippi Supreme Court docket will reflect, so this is the Mississippi Supreme Court we're talking about now, that's written the order because this is the docket we're dealing with, Mr. Jackson filed his principal appeal brief in this matter in the Supreme Court on September 28, 2021. Following the clerk's issuance of something or other, and then uh, this is the history of what happened with the court case, right? So then we get down 27th. What did Mr. Jackson put in? We put in a notice of constitutional question in which Mr. Jackson purports to give notice to the Attorney General of the United States of a purported constitutional question as to whether officers of the court and the underlying chancery court proceeding should be required to execute an oath and produce proof they are qualified to execute the duties of their respective office. All right, that's Mr. Jackson's filing, uh, Exhibit A. Uh, an affidavit of sorts in which Mr. Jackson states that he is the victim of a crimes by public officer impostors impersonating as judicial officers who maliciously heard the underlying chancery court proceeding before a tribunal not recognized by the laws of Mississippi using a simulated legal process, and at which Mr. Jackson further demands the offenders be prosecuted for their crimes and that he be compensated for damages to his life and liberty. Now, look at this is the bar putting this in that, well, this is what Mr. Jackson put in his paperwork. And they said earlier was absurd, right? So facially absurd. So it doesn't, you know, it, it isn't, uh, would be the proper word, procedurally correct necessarily. Not that the substance isn't correct, but uh, it wasn't procedurally correct, right? Because it's an affidavit of sorts. Well, then it wasn't an affidavit or it was an affidavit. And if it was, then it, it's an affidavit. And this affidavit of source is part of the problem that we have with uh, filing paperwork correctly and what exactly is an affidavit. Um, and then they I guess he's complaining that uh, no certificate of service was attached to Mr. Jackson's filing. The undersigned counsel did not receive notice of electronic case filing in connection with Mr. Jackson's filing of this document. 
Well, it's because it wasn't sent to you. Or these people are responding to something that uh, Jeff put into the court case to do with the appeal. And these people are coming from basically left field. Hey, we never got any electronic notice. The undersigned uh, first became aware of the filing on January 6th upon performing a routine periodic review of the court's online docket for this appeal. Uh, well, I don't think that's probably what happened, but who knows? Um, I think more like somebody said, hey, we got a problem. We need to go do something, right? Because they had to put this paperwork in. A document entitled Judicial Notice of Facts and Laws, right? This is another document that was part of the 17 pages, right? So wherein Mr. Jackson reports to inform the Mississippi Supreme Court of its purported duty to take judicial notice of purported facts and laws, purportedly bearing on the administration of oaths. Right, we put in copy one stat 23 and uh, four USC 101. If you've not followed me before and you're just now starting to watch this video, those are laws that have a particular oath that has to be done, standalone oath, all by itself, no matter what other oath they may have to take to satisfy the Constitution of the United States. Right, and that and the Constitution and the laws of the United States are superior to all other forms of law in the United States. The problem is, if you don't judicially notice the court that those are the laws you're using, then they don't have to pay attention to them. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, so that was that. And then a copy of certain federal and state statutes Mr. Jackson characterizes as relevant evidence. Okay. Uh, a document entitled Exception challenging the proceeding and constitutional qualifications of the officers of the Chancery Court of Panola County, Mississippi, in which Mr. Jackson alleges that the underlying Chancery Court proceeding was unconstitutional, and in which he further reports to request damages for occurrences of an intentional tort and prosecution of public officer imposters. Right? The bar is just picking out the you know, the juicy bits of the 17 pages and putting them in their own document and giving it back to the court again. These are the things we're, you know, this is what they're complaining about. Hey, this thing says that, so we want you to go ahead and strike it. Uh, pursuant to this court's rules, appeal shall be on record as designated pursuant to some rule, Rule 10. It is well settled that Mississippi appellate courts may not consider information that is outside of the record. Remember that. It's well settled. Mississippi appellate courts may not consider information that is outside of the record. So the question is, well, did, is the stuff we put in inside the record or outside the record? And then so they, then they list all these different court cases, reaffirming the court does not consider information outside the record. The Mississippi Supreme Court has not hesitated to strike extra record material submitted by a party during pendency of an appeal. Outstanding. So if it's extra record materials, the court will strike it. But if they don't strike it, which they didn't, then it must not be extra record materials. It must be material in the record. So on their face, the signed documents filed by Mr. Jackson were created while the appeal was pending. Hence, they do not and cannot constitute part of the record of the appeal. Similarly, the copies of legal authorities which Mr. Jackson purports to submit as evidence are not part of the record on appeal. Therefore, consistent with the authorities cited, the court should strike the entirety of the 17-page document filed by Mr. Jackson on December 28th or 27th. All right, so hey, you can't bring up the Constitution. Right, that's the evidence we're talking about. Right, purports to submit evidence. Well, those would be the laws that we're going to look at and the Constitution. But they're not part of the record of the appeal, is what they're saying. Right, but the thing is, right, see, these are what would be called legislative facts. And under the rules of, um, uh, Federal Rules of Evidence, I think it's Rule 201. No, it isn't 201. I, I have to go find it. Right, that uh, you can take 
taking judicial notice of facts, I think it's actually the 200 section, taking judicial notice of facts is something the court can do. Right? But it says that they don't, uh, there is no rule of evidence for legislative facts. Does that mean they can't take notice of them or there's just no rule saying how to take notice? I say there's just no rule saying how to do it, but if you tell them to do it, they have to do it. So that's what we did. Right? So, and that's what these people are complaining about. Further, as set forth in detail on pages 16 to 20 of the Mississippi Bar Official brief filed herein, Mr. Jackson did not assert any constitutional claims in the court below, nor does the record on appeal support any factual or legal pre predicate for any alleged constitutional violation by the Mississippi Bar Officials. Nor does the record on appeal support any factual or legal predicate predicate for any alleged constitutional well, we're not saying the Mississippi bar officials did it we're saying the people who pretended to be the court did it right the chancery court is what they have in uh, Mississippi it's a well uh, it's well settled that Mississippi appellate courts do not consider arguments raised for the first time on appeal right so for this reason the entirety of mr. Jackson's 17 page filing should be stricken Finally, the assertions contained in Mr. Jackson's filing are absurd on their face and warrant no consideration by the court. The court should strike aforementioned filing for this additional independent reason. The court should summarily reject, I'm going to quit calling him Mr. Jackson because that would be a mistake on my part, reject Jeff's improper, untimely attempt to inject new issues submit additional evidence, or assert novel claims for consideration on appeal. For the reasons set forth here, here above, the Mississippi Bar Officials request that the court strike the entirety Mr. Jeff's 17-page filing on the 27th. Further, the Mississippi Bar Officials, by and through the Mississippi, by and through the Mississippi Attorney General's Office, and at a considerable expenditure of state time and resources, have now been forced to defend a frivolous chancery court proceeding initiated by Mr. Jackson, who is pro se, followed by his equally frivolous appeal. Now forced to defend a frivolous chancery proceeding initiated by Mr. Jackson. Well, I don't know if Mr. Jackson uh, defended any chancery court proceeding. We'll have to find out what that is. Uh, giving the foregoing and bizarre and baseless assertions sought to be advanced by Mr. By Jeff, filing on the 27th, the Mississippi Bar Officials request that the court direct the clerk to reject any further filing by Mr. Jackson this proceeding unless and until he has first obtained leave of court to make such filings. Okay. So there's one thing that didn't happen, right? That when Jeff was filing these, he didn't ask for leave of court to file. And they're saying, well, that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, in further support of their motion to strike, uh, submit the following. Um, so now they put in a copy of just filing. Right, That's their support for their motion to strike is the filing that Jeff put in. So now the court can look at the evidence and say, well, you know, what do we say? So that's what happened, right? They they put this in, and this was on uh, the 7th of January. Let's see. Uh, direct the clerk of court to refuse and reject any further fine Mr. Jackson, Jeff, in this proceeding. The only exception being a motion for leave to file, right? So you can file a motion to leave to file, get an answer from the court, and then file, right? Uh... That's what they want you to do, unless and until he first obtained an order from this court granting him leave to make such filing. And then uh, you got the attorney generals on here by the this is by the attorney general, right? By assistant uh, special assistant attorney general. So they have these people's names on them as being the ones submitted it. This you know these fictitious entities here, but it was actually done by. 
the uh, general's, uh, attorney general's office for the state of Mississippi. State of Mississippi, Office of Attorney General, Civil Litigation Division. Attorneys for Pelleas, Robert Glenn, individually in capacity. Right, those are the attorneys for the for the appellees. Right? The freaking Attorney General Office. Okay, so that was what was filed back on the 7th. And I guess nothing's happened till now. And now we're at... Uh, I think the order was actually put, it on, put in on the 18th. And so if we were to look at the number of weeks, there's probably you know, a six-week period in there because that's kind of how these things roll where they have these six-week rotations of uh, the court. So if you do something in the second week uh, or in a particular day of a court, Six weeks later is when whatever the next thing would happen apparently has to be done, or, or that would be at least another. It would be in the next. They got a name for that. What do they call it? Term. They call them terms. That's what it was. In the next term. Not that it matters. So, okay, back to the order. So, this is what the court had to say. Now, they said this is the Supreme Court and the Appeals Court of the State of Mississippi. I thought it was the Supreme Court. That's what they just said. So how do we get in the Court of Appeals? Is that is that the Supreme Court? Or is this just another way of saying the Supreme Court? No, well, COA, Court of Appeals. All right, so, well, let's find out. So, uh, okay, so this is why I came in, because we put those papers in that they talked about. What all seeks to strike the filing for these reasons, uh, reasons, right? Which um, he raises these reasons to do it. And uh, while the court finds Jackson's, now they didn't call him Mr. Jackson. See, so yeah, now this court's not calling him Mr. Finds Jackson's December 27th filing is improper and does not present any claim that is appropriate for the court's review. The court finds no basis to strike the filing. The court finds no basis to strike the filing. That's huge. All that shit that the bar just said through the attorney general's office, and the court says, well, we don't see any reason to strike it. And now they're going to go on to explain their reasoning. Waddell's statement is correct that the documents are not part of the record below, and it's well established that the court does not consider documents outside the record of appeal. However, the filing does not appear to be an attempt by Jackson to submit materials outside of the record. Rather, it appears to be an attempt by Jackson to file a motion to raise additional arguments, which are simply various unsupported assertions regarding the validity of or constitutionality of the oath of office taken by officers of the court in the Panola County Chancery Court, which is a different version of wording for the court, as we'll see, than uh, I think that Jeff used. And this is the thing with the systems, right? They have, you know, like like here, um, I could live in Oakfield Township or Township of Oakfield. Right, they use both of them. Which one is it? Do I live in Kent County or County of Kent? Do I live in Michigan or State of Michigan? Is that in the United States or is that in the United States of America? Or all these different levels have like two different jurisdictions. And this is what uh, this is what Putin was talking about that the Ukraine he's dealing with is this administrative state that has nothing to do with the nation state below. That's why they want to get rid of nation states. It has nothing to do with the nation state below. They, the Ukraine they're talking about was created by taking chunks from these different uh, P- Crimea from, from Russia. And they took pieces of Poland and they took pieces of Hungary and then da 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 da. And then they gave them places, somebody else's pieces of land and They created this administrative state that has completely different borders than the nation states. Well, they've done the same thing here in America. Right? Michigan is a perfect example where there used to be a federal territory of Michigan, 
And then they wanted to become a state. And be just before they did that is when they had this border con conflict in Ohio. And uh, they changed the border. And they took some of Michigan's land. But to compensate them then, because they had done that, they gave them the Upper Peninsula, which was actually part of Wisconsin. And later on, they gave Wisconsin part of Minnesota. Right? And they're creating these... Um, administrative states that have different boundaries than the land territory of the public land survey had done. Right? And, you know, you can see it when you look at uh, uh, different forms of uh, legal descriptions for property. You know, they're, the public land survey system is pretty easy to read. Just go look and you can see what it says. Then go compare it to what they said yours was, your land description is. And you'll say, hey, these aren't the same. It's because they're not. They're using different sets of boundaries. So anyways, um, so Pinella County Chancery Court could be called something else later on. We'll see. Uh, further, the only two documents attached to the purported motion are copies of federal law and state statute that Jackson claims provide a basis for his assertions. The court declines to find that the purported motion or copies of legal authority are in proper extra record material. No, this court isn't going to agree that that's it's improper, that it's extra. Oh, no, that's right inside because it has to do with the law. Again, although Jackson's filings appear to be in proper motion or attempt to raise new constitutional challenge for the first time on appeal, and is not appropriate for this court's review, this purported motion only makes various unsupported assertions and does not include any improper extra record materials. Right? Again, this, right? again, they just told you up here in this paragraph, I'm going to tell you again, 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 although Jackson's filings appear to be improper, they only appear to be a proper motion or an attempt to raise a new constitutional challenge for the first time on appeal and is not appropriate for this court's review. His purported motion only makes various unsupported assertions and does not include any improper extra record materials. The only problem is, right, so I've already read this feature, this is my theory. So the problem then is we didn't support the assertion with an affidavit. Because they said on the other one, right, the, the attorney said a for, uh, an affidavit of sorts. In other words, it wasn't an affidavit. So this, we'll get into that later. But that's what I think it is, right? That if we were to, you know, do a, have to submit a proper affidavit in support of the assertions already made, then the court would, you know, fine for, uh, for Jeff. We'll, we'll be finding out soon enough. Anyway, so uh, the bar relies on some law. The search of the documents should be stricken. However, that stricken document, the Mississippi Supreme Court, where various court documents uh, correspond between appellate and circuit court that appellate had properly attached is reply, brief, and we're not part of the record of appeal. Jackson's filing here are distinguishable because it appears simply to be an attempt to erase additional arguments and submit law in support of those arguments, and not an attempt to submit documents outside the appellate record of the court or to the court. So what we're doing is completely in lines with what we could do in the court. It's just they're unsupported assertions. Therefore, the court finds that the to the extent that Jackson attempts to raise a constitutional challenge for the first time on appeal, the motion is improper and should be dismissed without prejudice. All right, that, you know, dismissed. Who ever heard of a motion being dismissed? I've heard of being denied. No, dismissed without prejudice to his ability to raise the issue in the proper venue which is probably the court below. I mean, I don't know what they mean by that exactly. Yet, but so, you know, one of the things I'm going to have Jeff do is we're going to file and ask for a uh, more uh, definitive answer or definitive, uh, yeah, description 
of what some of these things mean in this order. Let's see if the court will tell us some more. The court further finds that the motion to strike the filing should be denied. Right? So they're going to deny the Attorney General, but they're only going to dismiss what Jeff put in that they say is a motion. Um, but not uh, without prejudice to his ability to raise the issue in the proper venue. Well, then let's figure out how to do that. They're telling him what to do. Go raise it in the proper venue, brother. You're on the right track. So it is therefore ordered that to the extent that Jackson's pro se documents filed on the 27th are a motion seeking to raise additional claims in this appeal or permission to assert new constitutional claim, the claim should be and hereby is dismissed without prejudice. It is further ordered that the bar's motion filed individually, you know, the bar's motion, uh, should be denied. And here's a really interesting thing. Is, right, this judge used a digital signature. And if you ever get court paper and you just have, you know, just a, you know, somebody's name here with a scribble, and you're supposed to believe that that's their signature, because that's what they're trying to get people to do is, you know, believe that's their signature. Well, then it should have a stamp like this, apparently. I've never seen one of these before ever in any document that I've looked at for a judge where they signed their name and that it said it was a digital signature. So that's, uh, you know, if you got paper, don't have that on there, then send it back to the court and say, hey, there's no signature on here. Where's the digital stamp? I don't believe that that scribble is the judge's scribble. I think somebody's impersonating the judge. I want to have a have this investigated. You know, start stamping your feet and shit. Uh, let's hope we don't have to do that. But I'm just saying, this is what it probably should look like, is something like this where you have the name with the scribble and then over to the left, you got something to say, yeah, this is, you know, it's got a serial number to it. This particular signature on this document has been certified. This is huge, right? So this organization was the court of appeals, but it could just as easily be, you know, the state court that you're dealing with at a local level, circuit court or whatever. Okay, so that's, you know, that's that. That just happened. I got this yesterday. I said, I got to do a video on this. Because I was already working on this other one we're going to look at to do a video on. And uh, we'll fit them together. But I wanted to talk first about the constitutional thing. So, you know, let's just, let's review for a second. So in the sixth article of the Constitution, right? Uh, and this is the Constitution of the United States. It's not the Constitution of the United States of America. It's the Constitution of the United States. Er, hang on a second. All right, so Constitution of the United States, Article 6. Not the amendments. There, aren't, there cannot be any amendments until we get through the articles. And Article 6 says that the Constitution and laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or which shall be made, under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the, uh, to the contrary, notwithstanding. And then uh, followed up immediately by the senators and representatives before mentioned, and the members of the several state legislatures, and all, A-L-L, all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. But no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office of public trust under the United States. Well, that seems simple enough. So that was the Constitution. And then uh, just as soon as the Constitution was ratified, the very first law passed, enacted, uh, it's called, uh, right, that way. right, an act to regulate the time and manner of administering certain notes. June 1st, 1789. This is the first law in, uh, you know, Statute 1. This is 1 Stat 23, so it's in the first volume of statutes. On page 23 is the first law that was written. 
where it says uh, being enacted, yada, 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 that the oath or affirmation required by the sixth article of the Constitution of the United States shall be administered in the form following. So this is how she has to be done. To wit, I state your name, right? I A B, you solemnly swear or affirm, dial support Constitution of the United States. Period. Right? No so help me God, no nothing added. Not as part of another oath, but this is the form it has to be done in. This is what satisfies the sixth article of the Constitution. And it's required by all state, judicial, or executive officers. So, and then it goes on to say that, you know, it's the responsibility of the person who's claiming the office to go get this done and have the evidence that they did it. So if you ask him for the oath that satisfied the, you know, the sixth, uh, to satisfy the Constitution of the United States, this is what they would have to give you. Not the one they say, well, here's one I did for the state, which, you know, won't be anything like this. So anyways, this is the original law, right? Well, then at some point we went to um, codifying the law. And, um, you know, some sections are uh, positive law, which means... You know, that it is the law, just like it's written, or you need to go, if it isn't positive law, the code, then you need to go to the back to the statutes to find the law. But either way, this one's covered, because this would be in four, Title IV, which is the flag, seal, and seat of government, and the states. So for United States Code, Section 101, where it says every member of a state legislature and every executive and judicial officer of a state shall, before he proceeds to execute duties of his office, take an oath in the following form. To wit, I state your name, just only swear I will support the Constitution of the United States. Okay, so then what goes in the AB? Right, because you got to have a name there. Well, you have to use your full legal name. So mine's Robert Allen Ritluski, right? So I bet my, I, Robert Allen Ritluski, do solemnly swear. I couldn't put Robert A. in there or Bob Ritluski or some other thing. You're supposed to use your full legal name. It's why you have one to be used in legal matters. The problem is they hardly ever use our, le our name in legal matters. They want to call you Mr. Jackson. Right? So they don't like to use your full legal name. They don't want to recognize that you exist. Um, and then in this case, uh, so the next section, 102. Such oath may be administered by any person who by law of the state is authorized to administer the oath of office. And a person so administering such oath shall cause a record or certificate thereof to be made in the same manner as by law of the state he is directed to record or certify the oath of office. So there has to be a record that it was done. Right? And so, again, that's the, you can't, you cannot execute the duties of your office until you've taken this oath. And if you haven't taken this oath, well, then you're not an officer of the state. And if you continue to act like one, well, now you're an imposter. And your ass should be arrested. <laughs> okay, so more on that some other time, I'm sure. But, you know, that's where the basis came from, to complain as late as going into the appeals court. And the appeals court says, well, that's not outside the record. Right, the the problem was we didn't, uh, you know, we don't we have unsupported, um, not even accusations, uh, unsupported claim. They got a, they they used a particular. Uh, da, da, da. Rather simply, unsupported assertions. Right, and let's go look at the definition of assertion. Hang on a second. All right, assert, uh, to claim or challenge, to maintain or assert, to affirm positively, to declare with assurance, to aver, to maintain and defend by words or measures, to vindicate a claim. I mean, that's all good. It's good to be asserting your rights and liberties. Outstanding. Okay, if you went to my site, uh, Rob Ryder, R-O-B-B-B-R-Y-D-E-R, -B 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 on YouTube, and you went back far enough, like to uh, notice a constitutional question and subpoena. That's where I brought up the idea of, you know, I was reading the uh, rules of federal procedure, and they have this thing in there about constitutional questions. So 
You know, why, why doesn't somebody try this? Well, they did, and that's where this constitutional question ends foreclosure. All right, so in here we go through the order that was written by the judge in the first place to, uh, you know, to end the uh, to end the foreclosure. But that didn't uh, that didn't end anything. We kept on going. And so, all right, notice of uh, in motion on defenses is on that same case and so forth. So this this case got all sorts of things going on. <laughs> A little bit too hard to even keep up sometimes. But this is, you know, way back here on uh, 62 is where the judge dismissed the case. And you would think it's done, right? The case is dismissed. No, no more. No. But look at there's up to 75. I mean, how many different? Uh, you know, we're up to 103 now, right? So apparently just because something is dismissed doesn't mean it's no longer active, right? Because really a dismissal is just a summary judgment. You know, it was something reached without having a, uh, without without uh, using a jury at a trial, or even without a trial period. So, um, so what's going on? So what we're looking at now then is this uh, this 102 and 103 are actually the same thing, put in two different times. Um, and then. Uh, most of this stuff is things that was put in by this new attorney firm that got involved that wants to re argue the case, right? And that's what the order is about, is that. So let's get on with it. All right, decision in order. Uh, here's another one. Following papers were read on plaintiff's, uh, plaintiff's motion to renew and re-argue this court's decision and order dated uh, September 28th and defendant's motion to dismiss. But they didn't say what date that was dated. So I don't know which one they're talking about exactly. Uh, so this is a residential foreclosure action. And on May 4, 2015, Shelley Jones executed a note endorsed in blank and a mortgage in favor of Plaza Home Mortgage Incorporated. So we need to stop right now when Shelly Jones executed the note. It had not yet been endorsed in blank. And I should probably get a copy for people to look at in case you've never seen one, so bear with me. So there's two different ways you'll see this, and normally you won't even see it until you get in the foreclosure and you know, you're looking at paperwork that's been filed. So here's the note for this particular case we're talking about. And if we go to the last page of the note, well, there's Shelly signed it, right? And that's the end of the page. It's like, okay, well, there's nothing else there. But there is. There's this next page, which is a note allonge, which, you know, it's a, supposedly attached to the note. And it's, uh, right, so it says who the borrower is, property address, and it says pay to the order of, without recourse, Plaza Home Mortgage. But the pay to the order of is blank. Well, the, the words pay to the order of, that's, you know, a particular form of words or a formula that's used on a check. On a check, uh, there's a draft and a uh, money order, right? Pay to the order of. So when you see that, that on there, and if there was a name right here, well, then this would be a check pay the order of somebody. So it's been endorsed in blank because there's no name there. It's easier to see and understand when they actually do it on a note. So let's look at a note because this is how you normally see it. Now, this is just somebody's last page of their note without getting into the details. Right? Pay the order of. Well, as you can see, this one doesn't have anybody there, but this one has Wachovia Bank. Without recourse, right? Da, 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 da. And now Wachovia Bank is at the bottom, right, with another blank. Well, the... The person that should put their name here is you. Robert, Pay the order, Robert Allen Rutluski. And you would now have a check. Now, how you get the check negotiated, you have to be determined. I say, why don't you just take it down to your bank and put it in and see if they'll take it. Say, here, just go ahead and deposit it in my account. Let me know when it clears. It's a check. Right, but this is called an endorsement. And this is how it normally is. You know, you see it endorsed in blank. 
because this one had gone from one servicer to the next, they had to, you know, move all the paperwork, and then th that's how they do it. They paid themselves, paid the order of Wachovia Bank. Now Wachovia Bank has the money, right? So they're the holder. But if you were to say pay the order and put your name, then Wachovia Bank would have to pay you. Because with these notes done this way, it's the same as legal tender, but it isn't legal tender. It's bank money, and it gets to be, you know, handled differently, accounted differently, all sorts of things. But it has to be payable on demand and legal tender, which is what this, you know, statement here is for. Okay, well, that's enough on that. So that's, you know, what they said they did. But Shelly Jones didn't do that. Shelly Jones just executed a note. Just like this lady didn't do this. Right? She didn't. They did this after Deborah had signed her paperwork, had gone off to live her life, <laughs> stamp it, boom, put the stamp on it. It was done after the fact. <clears throat> uh, residential foreclosure. Okay, so back to this. The plaintiff moved for summary judgment and defendants cross moved for dismissal. The court issued decisions and the, of, on these two motions, the instant application ensued. Right. So way back in September, the um, plaintiff was looking for summary judgment and Warren and his wife, Shelley, had moved for a uh, dismissal. And then we put in this thing about uh, notice of constitutional questions. And that's when the judge issued the order, right? But she denied, at the time, she denied both the summary judgment and she denied Shelley and Warren's motion for dismissal. So that, that motion's already been taken care of, right? Because we're going to, we need to find this motion of dismissal that they're talking about uh, that she's still considering. And then she goes on to quote a law. This is a law out of New York, CPLR. 2221 governs motions affecting prior orders. A motion to re-argue is addressed to this court's discretion and shall be based on matters of fact and law allegedly overlooked or misapprehended by the court in determining the prior motion, but shall not include any matters of fact not offered at uh, prior motion. Okay, so you want to re-argue something, not have something new. Just talk about what's already in the record. Got it. Uh... While the determination to grant leave to re-argue a motion lies in the sound discretion of the court, the motion to leave to re-argue is not designated to provide unsuccessful party. Yada, yada, yada. Okay, then we got, uh, similarly, a motion for leave to review, because they asked for both. We wanted to re-argue and re renew. Is not a second chance to freely given to parties who have not exercised due diligence in making the first factual presentation. A motion to renew must be based on facts not offered on the prior motion that would change the prior determination and shall contain a reasonable justification for the failure to present the facts. All right, so the December 28th decision, the court denied plaintiff's motion for summary judgment and in order for of reference, because the date of default referenced in the complaint and the affidavit in support of the motion were different than the date of default contained in the 90-day notice required by another New York law, RPAPL 1304. So, in a nutshell, uh, one of the things that uh, the, the lender has to do in New York, they have to file this 90-day notice with uh, the Department of Revenue having to do with uh, the fact that they're going to start foreclosing. And on the paperwork that was submitted in the court, the dates were wrong. There's all sorts of things wrong with it, right? And that's what the judge said. You know, that's why she dismissed it, because the dates are wrong. Uh, the moving papers contain no explanation for the discrepancy. The court further dismissed the action, right, on its own accord. I think that's what Sue Sponte is. Due to plaintiff's failure to demonstrate strict compliance with RPAPL 1304. In other words, they didn't follow the, the law, so she dismissed the case. Right? Well, what, what did they do by not following the law? Well, they didn't, you know, the 90 day notice is wrong. Plaintiff requests renewal 
claiming the law office failure caused the lack of explanation for the inconsistent dates. Plaintiff seeks re-argument, alleging the court overlooks facts and law and dismissing the action. Now let's look at that, because what did we just say up here? You use renew uh, when you have new facts. And you do re-argument when there are new facts. Uh, new facts. Cause lack of explanation for the plaintiff seeks re-argument alleging the court overlooked facts and law in dismissing the action. Okay, well, let's see what they did. After review of the plaintiff's motion, court granted re-argument. The application was timely filed. In addition, the court made a mistake of law and that the plaintiff was not required to establish strict compliance with RPAPL 1304 because the defendant did not raise RPAPL as a defense in the answer or in their opposition to the motion. All right, so that's what the uh, foreclosures are saying. Look, you didn't bring it up, right, um, as the answer. Right, so that would be like as an affirmative defense. So that's the first place that should have been brought up is um, during the affirmative defense. Not really answer at all, just put an affirmative defense in. But nevertheless, um, defendants did not raise that uh, as an answer defense in their answer. Plaintiff summary judgment motion addressed its alleged compliance with RPAPL. However, while defendants answer opposition to the summary judgment motion cross motion makes numerous claims as to standing and the United States Constitution, none of these claims allege that the plaintiff failed to comply with RPAPL 1304. Thus, upon re-argument, the court vacates that portion of its order, which dismissed the action. The court is cognizant that the defense of RPAPL 1304 can be raised at any time up to an entirely uh, up into entry of judgment for foreclosure and sale. Now, this is some of the read between the lines stuff because, right, for Warren to use this as a defense, he can bring it up any time until entry of judgment for foreclosure, right? But because the case was dismissed, he couldn't do it then. But if they were to open the case again. Well, he could just go ahead and put it in again now to say what the judge has already said, that they didn't, uh, you know, the paperwork it wasn't done right. And, you know, then they would have to argue the those facts. Right? Compliance with RPAPL 1304 is a defense that can be claimed at any time. Well, so can lack of compliance then. Right? Defendants are pro se have filed a cross motion to dismiss. That motion contains constitution argument and variations of argument as to standing, among other things. Of note, plaintiff's notice of motion does not request that upon renewal of re-argument, its original uh, summary judgment be granted. So they're trying to renew this thing without asking for summary judgment. And, you know, <laughs> kind of in my mind, what they're doing is <laughs> trying to get it set up so that they can uh, give Warren the win. Right? Because they're not asking for summary judgment now. What's well, very interesting. That was the whole idea in the first place, to ask for summary judgment. The plaintiff acknowledges the original motion did not explain the different dates of default. So, duh. The plaintiff acknowledges the original motion did not explain the Different dates of default. In these circumstances, it seems to be most fair and prudent course that upon this matter's restoration to the calendar, both parties be given an opportunity to again file dispositive motions. Right? So basically, the, the judge is going to open it up and um, Warren can put in his motion for dismiss again. We don't have to wait for all this other shit they're going to be talking about in a minute because once they open it up, Okay, well, now we want to put in a motion for dismissal. Because the second motion that uh, Warren put in was after it had been, you know, closed or dismissed. 
let's uh, finish up here. So uh, it seems uh, most fair and prudent course. It matters restoration to the calendar. Both parties be given an opportunity to file dispositive motions. The court has considered the additional contentions of the parties not specifically addressed herein. To any extent, any relief requested by either party was not addressed by the court. It is hereby denied. Now, therefore, it is ordered. Plaintiff's motion for renewal is denied, but application for re-argument is granted. All right, so they can't add anything new. They can just uh, re-argue what's already been put in. And it's ordered that upon re-argument, that portion of the decision which dismissed the action is vacated. And further, ordered that defendant's motion is denied without prejudice. Right? Not, uh, yeah, deny without prejudice. So, the other one said it was uh, dismissed without prejudice. This one said denied without prejudice. Order that plaintiff shall file its motion for summary judgment on or before the 6th, 2022. Right? So, they haven't asked for a motion that, you know, that will have to come after April 6th. So, we're, you know, we're way here in the 18th of February. And they're not talking about a summary judgment until the 6th, you know, which is, you know, it's like six weeks away. So what's supposed to happen right now? Uh, let's find out. Defendant's opposition and or cross motion shall be filed the 27th. Uh, plaintiff's opposition and reply the 11th. Da, da, da. So this defendant's opposition would be to this motion put on the 6th, but we're not waiting until April 6th to put something into the court case. All right, we're going to go back and, uh, you know, and, and look closely at what the judge already said, that uh, the court's cognizant that a defense of RPAPL 1304 can be raised at any time up to entry of judgment for foreclosure and sale. So, you know, we could bring up the 1304 issue that she's already brought up. That you guys didn't do it, right? Right, defendants pro se have filed a cross motion to dismiss. The motion contains constitutional argument and variations of arguments to standing, among other things. Um, and uh, okay, the court determined plaintiff established standing, but didn't, but it didn't do anything with constitutional arguments. Right, so this one they're talking about this this cross motion to dismiss. They're talking about was filed after she had uh, disposed of the case before. So we should take a look at that real quick. Hang on a second. So we put in a motion to dismiss based on some one you know, other rule from New York, 13, uh, 3211, where we said take judicial notice, right? Now that should get the court to take judicial notice. And it sounds like she did because she, you know, she said that, uh, she acknowledged the constitutional things brought up in the notice to dismiss, right? Talking about the sixth article of the Constitution. Decrees this Constitution, laws and I say, shall be made pursuant thereof. Hey, we, you know, you can go read the Constitution yourself and see what it says, but, you know, that's what it says. And then this rule legislates that a party may move for judgment dismissing one or more causes of action asserted against him. The real parties of interest move the court to dismiss. Cause of action confirm their ownership rights, titles, and interests in the property and see it returned to them on the grounds that documentary evidence submitted as document one, which was a summons and complaint, uh, proves the summons did not, uh, proves the summons does not comply with uh, this other rule, right? So there's a problem with, with the way the summons was done. Among other things, it has no data filing with the clerk of the court. The plaintiff's complaint states claims upon which relief cannot be granted because the plaintiff has no interest in the property. The plaintiff's first allegation that uh, plaintiff is a limited liability company duly licensed and organized and existing pursuant to laws of the United States of America contradicts the license issued by the New York Department of State's Division of Corporations which states the Penny Mac Loan Services jurisdiction is Delaware, United States, which is one of the several states in the United States, and not the United States of America. 
right? The plaintiff claiming to be a duly licensed, organized, and existing pursuant to the laws of the United States of America does not have legal standing in New York or the United States. So let's, uh, can I have that here now? Right, so here, this was the complaint that they filed into this court case. Right, the, the original plaintiff, attorney. Right, the plaintiff is a limited liability company, duly licensed, organized, and existing, pursuant to the laws of the United States of America. So if you were to see a line like that in your foreclosure, you should go look the name of the company up in your state's um, business registration section. It's usually with the Secretary of State, but... You know, if you put in like Michigan Business Lookup, it'll take you, you know, if you Google that, those terms, it'll take you to uh, a link that you can click to go to the state website where you can put in the name of a company to tell you if it's licensed to do business there and so forth and so on. And well, there is a place called uh, Penny Mac Loan Services LLC, licensed to do business in New York. But when you look at it, sheet, it says that it was, you know, uh, organized under the laws of Delaware, comma, United States. So this plaintiff is actually, you know, obviously a different plaintiff. This is just how obvious their lies are when you know that they're lying. You just start looking for the lies, which means you've got to read what it is they, you know, they put in their documents. The plaintiff's fourth and fifth allegation pertain to Schedule C, which alleges a loan which was made by Shelley Jones as borrower. However, plaintiff offers no proof of a bilateral business contract between the lender and the borrower. There isn't anybody who's ever shown me they have a contract with a bank for the loan that they're supposed to have gotten. And the bank can't lend you any money unless <laughs> it's signed a fucking contract. It's called business. Right? This isn't gift in the state. This is supposed to be business. And there is, the bank never signs anything. The, the lender never signs any agreement with the borrower. And so all the payments you're making are not going to the lender. They're going into an escrow account. And they go into an escrow account because you and the borrower haven't signed an agreement yet. So it's like a good faith payment. All your good faith payments are going into this escrow account. This, this is whether you're foreclosed on or not. This is if you own a house, you're making a mortgage payment. It's going into a escrow account because you and the lender don't have a fucking contract. Right? So, you know, you want to continue paying, go ahead. But at some point you should say, hey, we don't have a contract. Uh, so there can be no purchase money loan by a lender to a borrower without the lender and borrower having executed a contract signed by both parties. Any presumption of the contrary notwithstanding. Where's the contract? Further, the name of the notes borrower, Jones, Shelley, difference from the name of the borrower, Shelley Jones and Warren Jones, whose address is 32 North Clover Street, Poughkeepsie, New York, da 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 da, borrower in the plaintiff's six allegation purchase money mortgages. Right? If, so if you look at the note, the, the name on the note says the borrower is Jones, Shelley. But you go look at the um, the mortgage, and the name of the borrower is this whole thing right here, Shelly Jones and Warren Jones, whose address is, you know, is the borrower. This, you know, this, ficti this fictitious entity they made up that looks like it has your names in it. Uh, the result is that the note in Schedule C and the mortgage in Schedule D have different borrowers. Neither document can be relied on as proof of the indebtedness, indebtedness claimed by the other document. Plaintiff's sixth allegation states purchase money order was executed in annex here too. Da, da, da. Conclusion. Plaintiff's insufficient process proved by documentary evidence deprives Warren Jones and Shelley Jones of property rights, titles, and interests without due process of law in offense of Amendment 5 of the Constitution of the United States. The plaintiff has no interest in any property that was made part of this proceeding. The property belongs to the real parties of interest. Warren Jones and Shelley Jones must be uh, and must be returned to them for their use and enjoyment. 
documentary evidence proves no loan was made by the lender to Warren Jones, Shelley Jones, or any other purchase money order, purchase money mortgage executed, acknowledged, recorded. All good faith payments made by Warren Jones, Shelley Jones, were deposited in an escrow account where it remains till this day. These payments are not being used to pay off a loan, but instead are held in escrow collecting interest because there is, to this day, no contract between the lender and the borrower and no contracted loan to pay. The escrow funds make up a portion of the property claimed by the real parties in interest, which is Warren and Shelley. In terms of plaintiff have shown their contempt for this court by filing an insufficient legal process, the same action being an occurrence of a personal advertising injury intentional tort of a malicious prosecution for which we are entitled liability damages as compensation. Attorneys for plaintiff and all other judicial officers involved in this proceeding must prove by certificate or record they execute the oath in four, Title IV of the United States Code, Section 101, if they plan to continue their attempt to deprive Warren Jones and Shelley Jones of their property rights, titles, and interests. Without this oath, <coughs> properly filed for record, the alleged state judicial officers will be denying us due process of law in offense of Amendment B-5 of the Constitution of the United States and are conspiring against the United States. Wherefore, Warren, Shelley, Warren Jones, Shelley Jones, real parties and in interests, require summary judgment in our favor dismissing for cause <coughs> and an order for this case, uh, for, order of this court that quiets the title, returns escrow, or is payment of legal tender, current value of the note, damages as compensation for occurrence of attorney intentional tort. All other relief required by this court to comply with maxims of equity mandate uh, to give a full equity. That got separated somehow when they put their signature in there. And we put in another document, notice a constitutional question a, a second time. All right. Um, this went in on 10 12. All right. Pointing out that, uh, you know, what the sixth article says, uh, and then what uh, one. USC 112 says that the statutes at large are the are the laws of the United States. So the question is: Does the Constitution require lawyer, law, lawyers acting in for defense, prosecution, and adjudication in a criminal or civil proceeding in the state of the United States to execute in this state of the United States to execute the oath in an act to regulate time and manner of administering certain oaths required? Of all United States and several states executive judicial officers and for them to have a record or certificate as proof. So this is the thing that the judge said that she's taking you know, cognizance of now. <sighs> right? The, um, the court has considered the additional contentions of the party not specifically addressed herein. And the same while being considered is actually part of some uh, Latin phrase. It is considered by the court. This formula is used in giving judgments. A judgment in the decision or sentence of the law given by the court of justice as a result of the proceeding instituted therein for the redress of an injury. The language of the judgment is not, therefore, it is decreed or resolved by the court, but it is considered by the court. Well, they didn't put it is considered by the court, but they put the court has considered. <sighs> right? And what they've considered is this uh, cross motion that's been put in. Okay. Well, hey, this is getting to be a little bit too long. I didn't realize it was going to take me that long to read through these, but that's the way she goes. So uh, these are just two different cases where, you know, we're not at all arguing anything they, that they said that we did, or that the you know that the defendant did. That isn't the argument. The argument is, does the person who says that the defendant did it have the authority to do anything about it? Right? If you want to be the prosecutor, I want to see your oath of office. You want to be the judge, I want to see your oath of office. You want to be the clerk, well, I want to see your oath of office. You ain't got one, well, then you're denying me due process. 
Because the sixth article of the Constitution says you have to take an oath to support the Constitution. And they wrote a law to, you know, cover which oath it is. And the oath that they're taking is not the proper oath. So I'm going to leave it there and post this. And, uh, you know, there'll be more soon. So keep following. We'll see what happens next. Have a good day. See ya.